You're listening to a podcast from evidencenetwork.ca, making evidence matter in Canadian health policy. As a society and healthcare system, we've been very successful at prolonging healthy aging. What we haven't been as good at is managing the end of life and then the comorbidities and the frailty that that is inevitably occurs, whether it occurs at 65 or occurs at 95 or 100. That's John Muscaderi, Scientific Director and CEO of the Canadian Frailty Network. Today, about one quarter of those over age 65 and half of those over age 85 are medically frail. That's over one million Canadians. In 10 years, those figures will double to well over two million. But what exactly is frailty? As Muscadari explains, it's not just about your birthday. So you may have, for example, an 85-year-old who is fit, who... Um, who um, may may respond uh, quite well as opposed to a 65-year-old who has chronic multiple diseases and is frail. So it's not the, the it's not the age; it's your physiological state that determines your response to 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 some of these interventions. At the moment, frail Canadians are the major consumers of health care in all settings. 45% of Canada's health care budget is spent on people over age 65, even though they only represent 15% of the population. But it doesn't have to be this way. With a better understanding of frailty, we can prevent or delay it with adequate social and medical supports. So ensuring proper nutrition or ensuring um, a significant exercise, even social interactions are, are, are important. Those type of supports, you can keep people at home much longer, prevent their institutionalization, um, and, and, and so not only is it better for the healthcare system, it, it's much better for the person um, that you are supporting at, at home. Most clinical research systematically excludes both the very sick and the elderly. As a result, healthcare often charges ahead without medical information to help families and healthcare providers of frail people in particular, sometimes with therapies and tests that are uncomfortable and ineffective. Take surgery, for example. Those surgical interventions may not increase life may may actually worsen uh, quality of life and in some cases reduce reduce the the quantity and the quality of of, um, of life that's not saying that that uh, that you shouldn't ever do surgical interventions but you need to be very cognizant of what what procedure you're going to do and look at the risk benefit in an older in an older uh, individual another suggestion Miskaderi says a one-stop shop would make life a lot easier for frail patients who are often negotiating multiple health issues among multiple specialists and multiple facilities, increasing the risk of things getting replicated or lost in the shuffle. The medical system right now is quite fragmented in um, in going from one uh, from one area to another, and one specialist or one healthcare setting or one institution may not talk to another. Records aren't freely uh, portable. He also suggests updating our funding model based on age rather than our current per capita model. People who are frail, who have multiple me- uh, comorbidities or medical problems, tend to use the healthcare system. Uh, much more, and and there are and some provinces and some regions are really seeing that their their populations are are um, are older, have more medical problems, and those are the those are the regions which are going to have higher healthcare uh, costs at the end of the day. And recognizing that in funding models would be a very nice way to to. Um, to match funding with, uh, uh, with use. While the government sorts out our economic planning, Muscadari suggests patients and families get on board with advanced care planning. This means recognizing that as we age, frailty is a possibility that, quite often, requires reassessing health care goals. For example, does a better quality of life necessarily mean a longer life? And when is more medical intervention worse for the patient? And, and those conversations are always very difficult. Uh, people have very different uh, expectations. There's cultural 
Um, there's a lot of cultural uh, um, uh, differences, and and we approach those very differently. But if those conversations had been had way before there was an acute deterioration and people had time to think about that, it would make the, the whole process much less stressful uh, for, for the patient, for their families, and for their healthcare providers. For Evidence Network, I'm Nita Das McMurtry. You've been listening to a podcast from evidencenetwork.ca, making evidence matter in Canadian health policy. Connect with the latest nonpartisan health research from experts across Canada and around the world, or sign up to receive our free monthly e-newsletter at www.evidencenetwork.ca. You can also subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. EvidenceNetwork.ca is funded by the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Research Manitoba, and the University of Winnipeg.